see people are still coming in. We're going to go ahead and get started and they can just keep on coming in. Um, welcome everyone to Mornings with Planning, a webinar series hosted the first Wednesday of every month where the Lexington Division of Planning and our guests discuss new ways to reconnect, reimagine, and respond in a new reality. These webinars will be held live and recorded for later viewing. My name is Lauren Weaver, GISP and Senior Planner with the Lexington Division of Planning, and I will be your moderator for today's January 6th, 2021 session. During this webinar, we will be discussing how we can fill in pieces of vacant land or infill and redevelop properties in Lexington and beyond as well to support responsible growth in Lexington within our urban service area. So kick back with your morning coffee or I have tea this morning and let's meet today's panelists. Uh, we have four really great panelists today uh, in no particular order. We have Dudley Webb, chairman and co-founder of the Webb Companies. We have Brittany Rothmeyer, JD and executive director with Fayette Alliance. We have Hal Bailey, AICP and senior planner in the city of Lexington. And we have Tom Harrington Jr., EVP of Acquisitions for Core Spaces. Um, an example of core space work in Lexington is the hub near the University of Kentucky. So panelists, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. I think it's going to be a really great conversation about a very important topic and you guys are coming from slightly different perspectives. So that's always enjoyable to, to hear the discourse and the perspectives. Um, let's begin with a little bit of an overview of your roles within Lexington, the state of Kentucky, and, and, and the nation according to what you do. Um, Dudley, can we start with you? Uh, I'd love to hear about your work as a lawyer and developer, and it looks like you do a lot of different work, whether it's commercial property or um, tenant representation, uh, with all kinds of different spaces, whether it's urban or suburban or mixed use. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. I uh, grew up in Eastern Kentucky, came here to Georgetown College to undergrad school, UK to law school, hung out my shingle here as a sole practitioner, and um, started uh, practicing on a limited basis, started investing in real estate on the side with duplexes and so forth. In the 80s, uh, got involved heavily in downtown Lexington. As a result of that, the number of insurance companies and from around the country were trying to, to get us to come to their respective cities and develop. And uh, so I had the good fortune of traveling to about 60 different cities in the country. We developed from New York to Boston to San Francisco. So I uh, had a lot of exposure and experience to a lot of development, tried to bring the best of the ideas that we saw back here. Uh, always loved, had an affinity for downtown Lexington, have an affinity for the, uh, for the horse farms, uh, preservation of the green belt, all those things contrary to what most people think about the web companies as developers. We, uh, we appreciate what we have here. It's a unique and special place and it requires you know, kid gloves and it takes time to get things done, but it's a great city. So I'm proud to be here. Thank you. Yeah, we think so too. It'll be good to hear about how your experience and all of those 60, did you say 60 different? 60 places? cities, yes. 60 cities has influenced yes. your work here. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Brittany, um, can you tell us a little bit about your work? I understand you have some practice in real estate law and now you're with Fayette Alliance with a commitment to uh, equitably growing the city and the rural area, which is always an interesting thing to think about and, and very important. Indeed. Well, thank you. And thank you all so much for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation to kick off 2021. So I'm actually originally from Northern Kentucky and came to Lexington to go to Transy and also went to UK law. Um, and I'm now proudly a retired or a recovering attorney, I guess I can say, <laughs> since I joined Fate Alliance. So yes, yeah, so I, uh, my background is in real estate law, um, joined Fate Alliance, and we are a community nonprofit um, dedicated to positively impacting planning and zoning policy through advocacy at City Hall, through educating our citizens, um, and through doing objective research to, to positively impact quality of life in Lexington as well. So uh, we promote smart, uh, equitable growth, 
um, in Lexington. And, you know, I fell in love with this city when I came for college, decided to stay and, and make my home here. And I think the balance that we have in this incredibly, incredibly unique place between our really thriving, uh, vibrant urban center um, and all the things that it, um, you know, offers to us combined with um, our green spaces and the productive economy that those create is just this really, really uh, unique, unique place um, that, that I decided to call home with my family. And so I'm really proud to be here and proud to be doing this work um, and really looking forward to talking about what kind of development um, you know, is going to be really key to our future, I think, in Lexington to continue to have that balance, um, but make sure that, you know, we're a, a city for future generations as well. Yeah, thank you. I didn't realize you were from Northern Kentucky. I actually grew up there too in, in rural mm. Kentucky. When okay. I grew up, you had to have a car and it took at least 30 minutes to get anywhere. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I like about Lexington is everything is within about 15 minutes and you can bike to most places. <laughs> I agree. The interstate was a daily part of my life. So <laughs> yeah, Florence, y'all. Florence, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your work throughout this discussion. Okay, let's um, continue to Hal Bailey. Um, so Hal, you work in planning services with zoning and development and subdivisions, reviewing things that are coming in um, for the future. And then I understand you also have a background in cultural resource management and historic preservation. I'm sure that influences your work to some extent as well. Can you tell us a little bit about you? Very much so. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, so originally I, I got a start in urban planning a little later, even though much of my background is focused on urban areas. Um, so I'm originally from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, moved around quite a bit, started in anthropology and cultural resource management, uh, lived in the Four Corners region for a while, studying uh, historic cities and, and prehistoric cities. So that was a major component of my life. Uh, as I was living in different hotels, working, working in cultural resource management, I, I came to the conclusion that I needed to shift my perspective and start looking at what is being done now and what we can see into the future. Uh, I went back to school, moved to New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, went to the University of New Orleans to get my master's in urban and regional planning, uh, really focused on how that city has really dealt with the uh, restrictions, not so much uh, like Lexington with the urban service boundary, but uh, the restrictions of the environment. Uh, looking at how that city has grown up and really dealt with trying to infill those areas that are environmentally and uh, sustainably able to be continually grown on, uh, growing up and not being able to grow out. Uh, when I had the opportunity to apply for a job in Lexington, which is from an urban planning perspective, a really important place with the 1958 uh, establishment of the urban service area, uh, I jumped on it, and uh, luckily I was able to get this position and, and move into the position of zoning, which uh, traditionally I am, I am more of the implementation and regulation side of things. I'm happy to talk about a, a broader picture here today. Um, so I, I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, that's a great point about how we can look to the past, but then also use that understanding to look to the future. That's such an important thing as we do consider how we can infill and redevelop, especially with things like you mentioned, the urban sur service area and how that does limit, but also provides more opportunities for creativity, which I think we will hear examples of in this webinar. All right, last but certainly not least, um, Tom, I'd like to hear more uh, about your work. So I understand Core Spaces is also in many places. Um, in Lexington, you have provided the hub, which is a really nice resource uh, that's mixed use. I think there are almost 500 beds there, if I recall correctly. Um, yep. So you do work in like market analysis and due diligence. Um, what Can you tell us a little bit about some stuff that you've been working on? Yeah, certainly. I, uh, I've spent my, my career in commercial real estate uh, um, both uh, brokerage activities and uh, developments. I'm uh, uh, born and raised and still live in Champaign-Urbana, uh, which is at the home of the University of Illinois. So um, I, uh, as EVP of acquisition since 2012 for CORE, <clears throat> I've spent a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of time on the road, um, not quite 60 cities. Uh, I can't, I, I'm not, I think I'm gonna catch Dudley, but 
uh, I think we've worked, uh, I personally worked on, I think, 25 projects in, in uh, 13 states. Um, and so core spaces uh, really was established. Uh, we're, we're largely a student housing developer, although, um, you know, we do some market rate and we mix some market rate in with uh, some of the student projects that we do. But, um, you know, the vision for core, uh, we're very, very location centric. Um, our, it's kind of like our, our projects, we like to be fall out of bed and into class, which in most, you know, really uh, requires that we are very, very particular about location. We're really an, an infill um, developer, a lot of high rise uh, as a result of that. A lot of our um, our projects require pretty um, uh, complex uh, land uh, parcel assemblages, and uh, you know when you're working in that environment, it, it's uh, it's fairly um, it's fairly difficult. So my role is uh, I, I lead the uh, the acquisition efforts. The team now is is much larger as Core Spaces has gone from delivering two projects a year to between six and eight. So. Um, the team has grown, but uh, through the um, early years, um, I did all of the acquisitions, uh, including the uh, the Lexington, the, the two in Lexington, and uh, also worked through the entitlement process. So I worked with uh, the, the planning department and and the city uh, there in Lexington, and and we had a very uh, very positive experience in uh, in in that process uh, there in Lexington in the relatively recent past. So. Uh, that's great. Well, thank you for, for being on the call today. I think Certainly. that the uh, hub is a really good example of mixed use in Lexington. Uh, right by the university, it provides housing for students, luxury housing. I've looked, I would live there. I would like to live there. <laughs> it looks like a, a luxurious yeah. location for sure, but with convenient access to things and it's walkable and bikeable. And that's so much of the benefit that can come from infill and redevelopment with those creative approaches. So thank you for your well, work. The second project is at Virginia and Limestone. Okay, uh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And it just, uh, it delivered last uh, fall. Okay, cool. Well, audience, I think we have a, a better understanding of our panelists now and a bunch more people have joined. So welcome if you haven't been welcomed before. We've just done the introductions and we're going to move into questions. Uh, if you sent us questions with your registration, thank you. I've worked to integrate those into our discussion today. Um, audience members in attendance, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A. We have Sam Castro monitoring that uh, and getting you answers and, and feeding them over to us as well. Uh, and I'll work to integrate those. So let's start off with a kickoff question. Um, infill and redevelopment can mean a lot of different things depending on the location and the community and the goals. Um, can you guys give each an example of uh, infill and redevelopment project that you've seen here or another place that you think is really neat? And just jump on in, whoever wants to go first. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll... One in particular, um, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt, but. No in our travels, my, my brother and I were in Washington. We were doing a project in Northern Virginia and happened to go to a new project at that point in time. It was in Georgetown Park. And as a result of what we saw there, uh, it was a like opportunity with a full city block called Victorian Square in downtown Lexington. And an opportunity of old uh, 17 older buildings. And um, through some uh, commitments by other investors with us, we were able to bring that idea back here. And it's one for the ages. It's a great use of a very historic block, but yet it was one that's lent itself to, I guess, three reinventions so far. We're, uh, we've done another one in the last five years of the block, but it was just a great opportunity. And um, one of the interesting things I also heard and listened to when I was traveling was the perception of Lexington. At that point in time, many called it the uh, America's only private national park by virtue of the beauty of the horse farms, which is kind of neat. And uh, so we were very concerned about trying to get the best of the ideas, encouraged others to do likewise. So our downtown today, I think, is, is a showcase and getting better and better. It involved intelligent compromise on everybody's part. And uh, it often takes a while to slow cooking to get things done here, but by the same token, it's been done right. And I look at Tom's projects out there, they're wonderful. 
and great additions. And uh, uh, it's a, a part of the uniqueness of Lexington, I said, we want to preserve that. But it was a great opportunity. And a lot of the stuff that I see and, and it's exci that excites me at my years here have been uh, the homegrown nature or the, uh, the uh, of the developments that are springing up now. You look at the distillery district and West Jefferson Street and National Avenue and all these things are homegrown. And uh, it's where you get your best of the ideas. People see opportunities and, and um, some call it gentrification. I don't necessarily call it that. I'm sensitive to that. By the same token, and these are the way we're going to do it if we're going to keep the quality of life that we have here and preserve what we have, the uniqueness. Victorian Square, I think, is a, a nice example of something that is to scale and has a lot of different uses in it, too. Um, professionally, I think there was a yoga studio there. If There might still be even. Um, I like that example. And I think something that we have to talk about when we talk about infill and redevelopment is how we accommodate for the change in ways that are healthy and sustainable. And I'm sure that's something that you guys are all thinking about as we move forward and seek to continue improving things and, and moving forward like we have to in ways that are responsible. Um, Brittany, I think you were going to jump in. You want to go next? Sure. No, um, I, I can think of many examples. The first one that comes to mind was something that was, was finalized and open uh, last year, and that was the senior living, affordable living mm -hmm. um, complex that opened in Meadowthorpe. Um, the AU Associates, um, uh, like I said, finalized last year. So I think that's a really good example because it accommodates for our aging population, which I know we've seen in, in so many demographic studies, that's gonna be an enormous part of our population in the coming years and, and figuring out um, how we can help seniors age in place in communities that are close to amenities and close to transit and close to family um, is going to be such an important way of how we address housing needs, I think, in Lexington and I think across the country. Um, and, and so that project, I think, was particularly good because of the way that um, it really worked with the neighborhood to, to come to fruition. Um, you know, uh, AU Associates went to the Meadowthorpe Neighborhood Association and worked really closely with them in developing, you know, what the neighborhood wanted to see. Because I think a lot of the challenges in infill and redevelopment projects come come with the neighborhoods. It's these these changes are going on, and there's so many different moving parts, um, and it's difficult for the developers and it's difficult for the neighborhoods. And so, trying to find that that really fine balance between those two and building those bridges is is no question an enormous challenge in film redevelopment projects and so I think that that's a, a good example um, that not only does it accommodate something that's really really needed here in Lexington which is affordable senior housing but it's um, a really great neighborhood bridge building example um, of what they did so there's a similar project um, in Chevy Chase on Duke Road, the Chevy Chase Gardens, um, which is uh, something that, you know, did the same thing that's accommodating for senior housing. So that's, a, you know, just kind of another example on the housing side of infill and redevelopment um, that I think has been really successful and, and looking forward to, to seeing more projects in that same vein as well. And I think, you know, Lexington has changed so much in the last 15 years since, since I've been here. Um, I think it's really come so far, especially as it relates to infill and redevelopment, which has this huge impact on quality of life. You know, as a young professional, um, after going to college here in law school, and, you know, there was a time when Lexington, you know, wasn't a place that young professionals wanted to stay. And it was that question of retention after people graduated from UK or Transy, you know, where were they going to head next? And I think we've come so far. And I think projects like Victorian Square and the building up of downtown into this thriving urban core is a big reason why young professionals have stayed and why we continue to be a place that people want to live with a really, really high quality of life. So seeing things like Victorian Square Square, like the distillery district, like Dudley mentioned with National Avenue, um, you know, building those places up is, is how we improve people's quality of life and make sure it's accessible. You know, you can get everywhere in 15 minutes. You can, there's all sorts of transportation options. Um, so having, you know, housing and amenities um, and, and transit services all close to our really core urban downtown um, is such a key factor, I think, in our quality of life here. Yeah, that's a good example of something that is, so this, with the senior housing, like it's designed for a specific purpose, but so mm -hmm. often when we do 
enact change in an area, there is more opportunity for more positive change that perhaps brings the community closer together. We like to talk about eight to 80, like so eight years old to 80, and how can we share those amenities? Um, I think one thing we've seen, as you've talked about, Brittany, is things continue to develop and grow. We also see um, stretches into the rural service area in ways that can also increase the quality of life for citizens. So Dudley, you mentioned the, it's like the, you said, the largest private national park. <laughs> but, and now we see, that, that, that's an interesting way of describing it. Um, but now we see things like the Legacy Trail extending into the rural service area and areas for people to recreate on public or semi-public land. Um, so it's cool to see how Lexington is changing and growing. Uh, but I think I'm rambling, so please, somebody else. What's well, another example of infill and redevelopment? I could, uh, you know, I, I can uh, tell you uh, maybe maybe two examples. Um, I'll start actually with, uh, you know, course philosophy is uh, we believe in a lot of engagement in our press and our uh, projects. So we spend a lot of time with, with the stakeholders, the neighborhoods, the, the cities. Um, and if you look at our buildings on our website, um, we, we don't build cookie cutter. We build into the context in the communities that we're in. So it doesn't mean that everybody always comes away happy, but um, we, we feel like, uh, you know, our projects are better for, for that engagement process. And part of that is um, many student housing developers, for instance, don't even bother to talk to the uh, university which they're going to build next to. And so, you know, really the, that part of our engagement uh, at, at, the, at UK really resulted in those two locations. Uh, if you, you may recall that um, the, pro the property that we originally had under contract was very strategically important to the university and we ended up with a pretty innovative uh, land swap that, um, you know, where we traded the two the old bookstore property for the two properties where our projects are now located. So I think that's a result of that. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I think that you can see that our buildings, um, hopefully we achieve that, you know, that they're uh, from a contextual standpoint, they're, they're, they're good and, and uh, have been positive additions to those areas. The other one that I'll just briefly run through, cause it's pretty interesting um, in Columbia, South Carolina, we repurposed a 20 story office tower that's uh, two blocks from the state capitol and, and the university. The state capitol, if you're familiar with it, kind of sits right in, at the, on the university property almost and two blocks from city hall. And it was a, uh, a vacant 20 story office building adjacent to a Marriott hotel with shared uh, common areas and undergoing a, uh, a significant renovation. In addition to that, the parking was in a city owned parking garage behind it. And um, so there was really a lot of tri-party agreements to be negotiated and trying to, you know, to explain to a Marriott hotel uh, that's, that's spending $10 million, how 900 college students in next door to them and connected to them is going to be a good thing. And, uh, you know, the, the mayor there credits that project with really a revitalization of, of, of the downtown. The, our, po our outdoor amenity area, the swimming pool and outdoor sand volleyball and all that is located on the top floor of the city owned parking garage under a long term license agreement. So really, um, really, I think it, it demonstrates that when you're doing infill, um, there, there's uh, a real need for creativity and, and flexibility. And, and uh, so we, we see those sorts of things a lot. Good. That's really inspiring to hear. That's something I think that we've been talking about in planning for a while, but maybe um, exacerbated, for lack of a better word, um, by the reality that we're experiencing right now as we consider how do we repurpose spaces that are viable structures. So, so thank you for sharing that. I hope we can get more into that as we continue this conversation. And I, I can jump on that just a little bit. I, I think with our zoning ordinance and some of the things that we have done over the past 15 years or so, uh, one of the, the major components of the infill and redevelopment aspect is the inclusion of adaptive reuse, uh, specifically in our older areas of town. We have a lot of remnant industrial space that isn't really 
useful for those kind of industrial uses any longer. Uh, residential has really built to it. Our uh, perspective of uh, residential growth has kind of changed. So uh, a place like the Gray Line Station on North Limestone and Loudoun, which uh, opened uh, about a month ago, is a really great opportunity to reuse a building that was not being utilized allow for greater construction on that site, new buildings, uh, the potential for residential at some point, and then also the availability of uh, new resources. So uh, with Wilson's uh, Deli going in there, there's the availability of deli meats, milk, things like that. With Black Soils being uh, located in the Gray Line Station, there's really that availability of uh, produce, of eggs, all those other things that were kind of lacking in an area um, that now allows also for incubation space for small businesses from that area. And it's really trying to prop that up with the Julieta market. So there, there are some really great um, redevelopment projects that are going on, which we're building brand new uh, and we're, we're kind of building up which allows us to use our urban service area in a greater way. But there are also some uh, infill and redevelopment projects that are utilizing the space that's available, filling in that space and providing new resources. Yeah, thank you for those examples. Um, I think we're seeing that across Lexington too and that these like hip spots like National Avenue and the distillery district are becoming very popular and kind of niched into this concept of adaptive reuse and we, and we see attempts to retrofit those spaces, get better access to those. And those are challenges that we have to face and find solutions for, but they're challenges, which are also opportunities. So that's really well said. Um, I like those examples of, of local businesses too. Getting a mix of things really can enrich our community, I think. All right, so let's keep going. Um, so when we talk about infill and redevelopment, um, in this initial conversation, we've already acknowledge some of the very real challenges that come with infill and redevelopment, whether it's space or getting access to it or working with existing structures, um, preserving trees. Uh, what are some of the biggest barriers or roadblocks that you guys have seen um, and how do you recommend navigating those? Um, this is just for anyone if you feel like you'd like to, to weigh in on obstacles and, and approaches to navigation. I'm sure that that Dudley and Tom of you know at, at being developers have have really seen this up close and personal. Um, you know, from from a fatal lines perspective and ad, and an advocacy perspective, and, and trying to really understand both sides of it. I and I think the city and and planning has acknowledged this as well. There's so many regulatory barriers um, to doing in film redevelopment, and that really comes as a result of the fact that we have to modernize our zoning ordinance um, to really be consistent with the type of growth that we're now trying to encourage. The type of growth that we had you know, in the 50s and the 60s and 70s um, is, is a very different type of growth than we're now trying to encourage. And we have got to change and modernize and update our zoning ordinance to make sure that, that the development that we wanna see, these infill and redevelopment projects, projects like Dudley and Tom are both working on, that they can be successful, that it's not cost prohibitive, that it's not, you know, just kind of obstacle after obstacle through our through our zoning ordinance. Um, and so I think reducing those barriers is so, so critical in, in ensuring that we can see the growth that our entire community really, really wants. And that's an efficient use of our land, um, you know, using the acreage that we have inside our urban services boundary, which is significant, um, but we've got to make sure that, that the developers can, can utilize that land um, through our zoning ordinance in, in a way that's productive and that, that we want to see. So I think the, the changes that, that you all in the planning department are making, like the Florida area ratio updates, um, like updating our open space and, and amending our, you know, reducing our parking requirements and things like that are all going to be so critical. And I think that, you know, it's difficult. These changes are really difficult in the community because things have been the same for a long time. We've seen this status quo. And again, because it's been like this for decades, um, but I think modernizing our ordinance and really um, looking to reduce those barriers to the type of development that we wanna see is the, is, the, is the real way forward. Yeah, Hal, can you talk a little bit to the recent changes in zoning ordinance? 
Yes, uh, so we've had a few different changes. The FAR was probably one of the, the more flashy ones that occurred recently, which we, FAR is floor area ratio, which looks at the percentage of a lot and how high or how much you're building onto it. Um, and there is a great uh, little description of that, uh, that Long Range Planning has put out on their website for Imagine Lexington uh, that I would rec really recommend if you're looking to learn more about that. A couple of the other things that uh, planning is really focused on was not only increasing the availability of uh, the structures that could go on some of these uh, small lots or uh, more structures on larger lots, but reducing some of the barriers, especially to affordable housing. Um, over the past couple of years, there, there's always been a provision that allowed for some affordable housing uh, increases, whether that's FAR or reductions in parking. Recently, there was a uh, zoning ordinance text amendment that allowed for a change in our ordinance that uh, reduces the amount of parking that is necessary for uh, affordable housing projects. That allows them not only to build more on the space because they don't have to fill it up with parking, but it also reduces some of their costs. Parking is an extreme cost to most development. Uh, when we're looking at some of these changes in the ordinance, we, we, don't, we also want to allow for uh, some of those uh, really great add-ons uh, and really great market rate things, but we also want to really push for new affordable options within our, our city. Uh, there is a, a major issue with kind of balancing that act. Um, I would also say it, it is, it's harder to do infill and redevelopment as both Tom and Dudley will, will know and Brittany has experience with as well with just getting parcels together. When you're looking at infill and redevelopment, if you're trying to do a larger project, all too often, you're trying to buy parcel by parcel or group them together to try to get a larger project or something that uh, can, can work for you. So it's incumbent on staff to help out with some of those smaller projects too. Uh, we wanna not only see the larger scale 500 uh, apartment kind of projects with Tom's uh, hub project, but we wanna also see the availability of the missing middle, those triplexes, fourplexes, sixplexes uh, in our city, uh, that, that fabric that was there really before the 1940s to allow for some incremental change. And that incremental change plays into another problem with infill and redevelopment, which is blending the old with the new. Uh, as a planner and specifically the, the zone change uh, planner, I, I'm also often the, the, the voice of that change. Um, so I have to be really cognizant of how the old is, what, what is this historic fabric of our city, um, whether it is 20, 30, 40 years ago or 150 years ago. How does that play into this new development? And we don't want to just replicate the old. That doesn't really get us what we need. We, we need something new. We want innovative solutions that get at our problems today. So it's, it's that balancing act of not only getting those large scale projects, but getting that missile, missing middle, while also trying to uh, find that, uh, that transition, that good transition from what's existing to what we want in our future. And, and excuse me, I, I uh, commend both the staff and the leadership of the city. I really feel like in the last couple of years, it's really made a difference in the approach uh, one of the difficulties we have here is obviously some people just don't want to change. They just uh, not will appease them or whatever, and we go to great lengths to try to do that. But at some point in time, it involves intelligent compromise also. And I think this city's taken a, a big step forward in that. Uh, I look at, at the challenges of the parking at the city center project. $51 million for 700, 700 parking spaces, but we couldn't do it without it. And that was the major holdup, was to figure out creative financing to get that done. And uh, one of the vehicles by which we were able to get that done was obviously through the TIP. And the interesting thing about it is the project that as it exists today uh, generated enough last year, the payment from the TIF payment, the reimbursement back to us, was a million and a half dollars, which paid the debt service so much. So creative finance, cooperative effort, state government, local government, everybody team to get something that needed to be done. So the, then the question then becomes, you look at the core, you look at the surrounding neighborhoods, obviously they don't protect what's there. 
but uh, I think the right decision also was we've got to go up at some point in time. And uh, those of you who remember the city center project started out at a 40 story building. We ended up with three stories or three buildings of uh, basically 12 stories each. Got to the same goal, right choice, right compromise, but it worked. And what we're trying to do and would like everybody else to try to do is do something for everybody. We've got to get something that's appealing. And we talk about housing. Uh, we did the Woodlands, which catered to higher end clientele. Uh, the new city center condominiums are beautiful. Uh, selling lifestyle, uh, carefree living, uh, convenient parking, full amenities, restaurants, Jeff Ruby's access, all of those things. And who would have thought that we closed two transactions this week of $2.4 million or more hmm. for that high-end residential. Hmm. But the next step, though, is we had also attend to the needs of middle as well as affordable housing. And I think that's important. We're trying to do that as well. There's some sites in the downtown, in the area that where that can be done. But it's going to involve intelligent compromise. And just coming back and say, well, whatever it is, I just don't like it. It's not probably not the answer. So again, we're, we're just sensing that people are realizing that what it's going to take. An interesting story that most people don't know that came up right in the middle of our construction, we're building a garage, filling up the hole down there. And I get a call from a friend in Nashville and said, I have a person who would like to come up and look at your project. I can't tell you who it is. We've signed a confidentiality agreement. And the guy came, um, spent an hour here, and we, we never really knew who it was. And, and they never told us. And a year later, I called back and I said, who was that? Who was the guy? He's well, I can tell you now. It was Amazon when the city of New York decided that hmm. they weren't going to take them, or Brooklyn. Then uh, they were trying to figure out what they were going to do for the needs. Looked at Lexington, loved the city center site, loved the project. The timing didn't match up. Mm -hmm. So to a great degree, we've got to build it and they'll come. But uh, an example right there of people that want to share in what we have here and appreciate the quality of life and the good things we offer. But we really have to be protective as well to be sure that we don't overdo it. So I'm sensitive to both. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Mentioning uh, the way that you can uh, creatively finance to accomplish things and the way that updating the regulations can make a really big impact. I think those are important things for us to remember. But I really want to circle back to, to what you said, Dudley, about um, negotiation. I don't know if you use that word specifically, but when we negotiate, there are a lot of ways to do that. And the maybe the least productive negotiations are the ones where you come to the table and everybody saying absolutely no, no way, we're not gonna meet you in the middle, versus thinking of it more of a perspective of win-win. How can we look at what we're trying to accomplish and what you would like and align those things so we have a better overall project? And it sounds like that's something that you value. And it'd be great. I think all of our cities and rural areas would be a lot better if we could come at it from that perspective. Um, we have a lot of questions still. I'm having trouble choosing which one. Um, you guys mentioned missing middle. I've got some stuff on that. Um, you mentioned funding. Let's let's circle back to, to missing middle a little bit. Um, so missing middle is something I think how I think you just mentioned it. Um, so for those who are may not be familiar with that term, it's um, a term used to kind of encapsulate different types of housing that are somewhere in between um, like suburban, single family, and very, very high rise. And noting that all of these types of living have a role, but missing middle of focusing more on things like duplexes, townhomes, cottages, fourplex, uh, fourplexes. So what role do you guys see for missing middle in the coming decades as we face housing crises and limits of um, space within our urban service area? and all the reasons that we want to preserve that. Um, and, and in that same capacity, do you feel like there's opportunities to find more missing middle housing through uh, conversion of commercial properties, for example, even like smaller scale commercial properties? So that's a, that's a loaded question. That was like 16 questions all in one. So <laughs> please, missing middle. 
Well, uh, I think that the missing middle definitely plays a part. Uh, I think that large scale projects are really important, uh, at especially getting at a, a really dense development that is providing amenities and, and things like that. I think miss missing middle is a fabulous intermediary between some of our suburban uh, kind of more suburban areas in town moving into the, the higher structures. So it allows for a, a bit of buffering uh, from the, the height and kind of the, the, the shade effect that you might see with large scale structures. Um, but it also provides that, that little dense the increase that, that provides what Lexington really needs. It also allows for a little bit more of affordable options often because you see them a lot of the times as conversions or located along some of our uh, collector streets. So are a little more high intensity roadways that allow for that transition into our more uh, less dense single family neighborhoods. Uh, and I think within our our infill and redevelopment area, which is reflective of that 1938 Sanborn or 1934 Sanborn map, I think that is a really great area for some of those dense, uh, air, uh, dense missing middle kind of complexes that will allow us to transition into that really dense downtown that uh, has really developed around some of Dudley's and Tom's uh, developments. I think, you know, missing middle is probably. I know you said it's a part of it. I think it's probably one of the most critical pieces for Lexington in particular. Um, I think that, you know, in 2017, we did it when the city did a housing study and, and Beta Alliance was a partner, the home builders were a partner, Elbar was a partner. Um, and, and one of the most significant parts of that report that came out, a study of demographics and population trends and things like that, was the fact that we need to address our housing needs. We need a diversity in housing types. Um, you know, we can't, and there have been a significant increase in, in permitting and things with large multifamily um, development and then single family homes. And, and what we're really lacking is, is that missing middle um, to that point, is that incremental density that we can and need to accommodate um, to, to really address our, our housing supply issues. Now, you know, Lexington's facing those issues. Every city in the country is facing those issues. You know, cities without any zoning requirements like Houston are facing these issues um, because diversity in housing options opens up affordability. Um, you know, increasing the types of housing options that we provide makes those options more affordable um, as well. And so I think that's in order to, to develop and grow in an equitable way, in a sustainable way, um, in an efficient way, I think missing middle and opening the door um, to, to those different types of housing that we just haven't seen here in a very long time uh, is going to be really critical to the way that we grow. I think often about an, an area like Chevy Chase, and I use that as an example because that's an area that has missing middle housing types where a lot of areas do not. So it's a mix of single family, duplexes, fourplexes, um, and, you know, even more multi more dense multifamily. Um, and so I think, you know, that we don't see that often anymore because our regulations don't permit it in many areas. It's either, you know, uh, it's either single family um, or a higher density residential. And so I hope that, um, and again, this, you know, does go back to, I think, the barrier around regula the regulatory barriers is we have to find a way to, um, increase the permissibility of missing middle housing so we can get that diversity of housing options, so we can get more affordable options, so that all of our, our citizens can afford, you know, to live, work, and play here in Lexington. And that missing middle piece and increasing those housing options is going to be a really important part of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, please, Tom, go ahead. I was just going to mention that uh, some uh, along the way there's something, I think it may have been you, uh, Lauren mentioned the um, re, you know, the opportunities to repurposes of, of commercial properties. I, I, I do think there is uh, a, probably a growing opportunity with that. Uh, we just broke ground on a project uh, in Tampa, approximate to the University of South Florida, that's a 100-acre broken regional mall that um, a national developer is doing an, an amazing uh, kind of a lifestyle research center, um, tearing down some of the buildings, yeah. turning others into kind of workplace spaces and uh, 
built a lot of density added to it for high rise research type of, of opportunities and, and both market rate and student housing. So um, what was a lot of concrete and empty buildings is, is going to be pretty interesting. So, and I think those opportunities will increase. I think that adaptive reuse is going to be a, an important part of the future here. And also um, better utilization of some of the sites that we do have, like in the core, we have so many surface parking lots that are really going to waste. And uh, eventually we'll wise up and go ahead and develop on those and they need to be out and they need to be all types for all people. So uh, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, I look at the office buildings in downtown Lexington. We looked at several for adaptive reuse, perhaps for residential. And uh, with code requirements as they are and so forth, it gets pretty cost prohibitive. By the same token, there's, there are some vehicles available still for uh, creative financing, uh, investment tax credits is going to be the big one. I think it's still available. And uh, it's, it involves creative finance, cooperative efforts between the city and the state, as well as the feds. And uh, I think with the new administration coming, I think you're going to see a heavy investment in infrastructure here that will help us all. And with the availability of those type of funds, then we can do more. I think uh, Tom and, and Dudley have brought up two interesting aspects of, of it, getting rid of some of those uh, large scale areas, uh, surface parking or large office parks that uh, are something that we're really interested in uh, really getting some sort of redevelopment on. Uh, Brittany's totally right that, I mean, if we develop a, a really centralized and, and dense urban core, we, we can kind of extend out and slowly but surely uh, absorb a lot more land and not displace some of our historic areas and, and, and do so within a way that, that's more context sensitive. Um, I think that that also gets into one of the, the questions that was on here about the heat island effect. Uh, surface parking lots are not great for our city in, in several different ways. One, it's an underutilization of the land. Uh, parking a car is not the best utilization of downtown land. Uh, we need parking garages. I, I, I don't negate that fact. I, I think we, we need to make sure that people are able to get downtown and do so in different modes, but also uh, if they are choosing to do so in a vehicle, park it. But when it comes to a large scale parking lot downtown, we do need to be looking at structured parking. That's a better utilization of our land. It's a better utilization of our downtown space. And then it can lead to uh, new opportunities in amenities, housing, uh, which then can lead to greater amounts of access for mobility patterns into the downtown area. So I think uh, there, there's some really great opportunities for redo, uh, reuse of downtown landscape while also looking at some of our older office spaces that aren't going to be utilized in the same kind of way uh, that it has been in the past 40 years or so. Yeah, so all of these things are absolutely connected. I'd like to continue this conversation that we're having right now, but focus a little bit on um, green spaces as we come closer to the end of this always very short hour. Um, so Hal, you mentioned urban heat island, um, we have questions in here um, noting the cost of land in Fayette County, which is not low and it is increasing. Um, and we have information about uh, or questions about Town Branch and the impact that Town Branch can have on Lexington. Um, Town Branch is a shared use trail that's going to be going through downtown. And then we also have the legacy trail that goes up and into the rural areas. So there are all of these pieces, um, PDR properties. So we have a, a preservation program here in Fayette County that seeks to preserve farmland for farm uses. And I think we have um, just over 30,000 acres of farmland preserved now. So there are a lot of components about this, increasing uh, the ability to access things like you guys have mentioned. When we're more dense, that means more people can get to more types of places with many different types of transportation, whether it's walking or cycling um, or driving it or using a bus. So what I'm getting to, <laughs> we have a lot of questions about green space on a little bit of time. Um, I'd like to hear what you guys think about how we balance the urban and the rural uses and how those two really can actually work together to make the urban and rural areas stronger and better and increase the quality of life for our community. 
I think that, you know, many people think that our urban and rural are, are dueling forces when I think more than anything, they're extremely complementary. Um, uh, you know, our, the 30, you know, over 30,000 acres that PDR has protected, um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the PDR program. I think that, that most importantly, um, you know, it's, it's really essential to note the economic driver that agriculture and rural land is in, in Lexington. And I think a lot of times this does fall by the wayside because we think of agriculture and, and farms and horse farms and things like that, it, because they're this, you know, essential piece of our identity and, and culture. Um, but, you know, agriculture contributes $2.3 billion to the Lexington economy, and it's one out of every 12 jobs. So it's this really significant economic driver. And I think, you know, I always, we, that's, that's part of a research project that, that Fate Alliance worked on with UK. And when I came over to Fate Alliance, that just, you know, made my eyes very wide um, because of the significant economic impact. So, you know, while, while it is beautiful to look at and drive through, it's also this, this huge economic presence. Um, but I think it's really complementary in the way that it, it pushes Lexington Fayette County to be really innovative and to be really creative about the ways that we use our land and our existing land. Um, you know, when I think about, um, you know, the, the ways that we've kind of have to grow up, you know, and as opposed to out because of our urban services boundary makes us think a little bit harder and more strategically and more efficiently about the, we're, the ways that we're going to use our existing land. Um, and I think that they're, they're, really two sides of the same coin. They make our community what it is. They provide this enormous economic driver to our economy. Um, and they, they also, you know, enhance our quality of life. Um, so I think thinking too about green spaces inside the boundary is incredibly essential uh, to our, you know, when we're talking about open space and green space and trees and things like that are really, really critical to our quality of life as well. I think it's a really important aspect to look at the, the urban service area as not just a, uh, a boundary, but also a cost savings. Um, with the implementation of the urban service area, it was really focused on saving its city, uh, the, the members of our city money, because the moment we start to sprawl is the moment that we need to provide re uh, access to amenities or access to water, to the uh, sanitary sewer, all these things cost a significant amount of money uh, and then also get usually passed on to the denser areas. So I, I think it's really important to look at the urban service area as uh, being a way to control things, both economically, environmentally, and socially. Uh, it really gets at, at trying to make sure that we're doing things in the most appropriate way. Now, if we were to expand the urban service area tomorrow and include all of the, uh, the land outside the urban service by some miraculous thing, that doesn't mean that it's gonna make everything inside the urban service area more affordable, nor does it mean that it's gonna make everything outside what the current urban service area is now more affordable. Um, there, there are a lot of implications when you talk about opening up the urban service area that are going to increase costs for those that live in the city, but also increase some of the environmentally unsustainable uh, kind of development issues that other communities are seeing. We, we in Lexington, and this is represented by uh, our elected officials, as well as our comprehensive plan, which is representative of our public, uh, have made that real decision to say, this is both an adequate resource economically, culturally, uh, and then it's also really smart for us to do the most uh, sustainable kind of growth possible, which is really focused on that infill and redevelopment aspect. We have a lot of land still inside the urban service area that has yet to be developed. It, uh, and there are great opportunities that for land to be redeveloped uh, in some of our more dense areas of town, and then also in some of our oddly shaped lots outside of the infill and redevelopment area. We have a lot of space out there that is still yet to be absorbed. So I think it's really important to look at that rural service area, not only as a environmental issue, a economic issue, but also uh, not something that will alleviate or be a silver bullet uh, to get rid of all of our affordability problems.
use. There are things that we do need to change in our zoning ordinance that we're working very hard on to try to get at some of that incremental change while also looking at real radical ideas to try to get at affordability. Uh, someone did mention the, uh, the ADUs and some of the ordinance that is, is still waiting to be reviewed. Uh, I, I think that is a really important way to get at some of the uh, solutions for incremental change. But again, I, I do think that getting denser projects like we're seeing with, with Dudley's project or Tom's project helps to alleviate some of those uh, those demand issues and supply issues that we're seeing within the urban service area. Yeah, those those are really important points to note. Uh, so we're coming up really close to the end of the hour. Um, I'd like to wrap up with a couple of uh, quicker questions just to try and squeeze in as much as we can before we have to end. Uh, it's already been a really good conversation. We've got to pack in as much as we can. Um, so this is a, a question really for anyone that feels like they might be able to offer some um, insight. Um, so often individuals in a neighborhood that live there or frequent there have ideas about how to develop their own neighborhoods, um, maybe as a restaurant or a small business, but there are so many obstacles to that development um, that maybe change on who you are and the background that you have and the access to financing that you have so the question I have is, um, what advice might you offer to somebody who's interested in developing a piece of property but is confronted with all of these challenges and a little unsure of how to overcome those? That, that's, uh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. I, I think sometimes it's finding the right resources that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's... Uh, Brittany's or uh, uh, economic development, but uh, sometimes if you can find a uh, an accessible uh, uh, economic development function that uh, that's aware of all those programs, and um, uh, that's often a good resource for someone trying to do that. And then I think from a from a code point of view, the more flexibility you can build in to accommodate some of those kind of creative ideas. That you know, it's kind of like the old corner grocery store, uh, you know, convenience store that, you know, was 100 years ago on a corner in a neighborhood, and then how do you reinvent that in a thoughtful way to provide the opportunities for those sorts of things? Yeah. Brittany, do you want to throw in there? Sure. Yeah, I think talking, you know, just with, with being such a, you know, being a, a size of a city, I think that is very accessible. Um, I think a lot of those resources are go underutilized and sometimes it's just, you know, where's the information about who I do need to contact? How do I, you know, what, what are my next steps? And I think educating um, our neighbors and our citizens and our fellow Lexingtonians about these issues is really critical. Um, and that's something certainly that, that Fate Alliance tries to do. But I think talking to your neighborhood association um, is, you know, a really key part of that if you're not involved with your neighborhood association, you know, going on the city's website and figuring out who that is, who's involved, talking to your council person. These people are, you know, if you can figure out the right way to find where these resources are, these people are really accessible and available to talk you through these sorts of things. Um, but I think part of it is, is all of us and, and Fate Alliance included, educating people about where these resources are um, and who you can talk to. Because I think that it is a community and I've found since I've been here, um, what I love about Lexington is that, you know, if you wanna plug in, you can. It's just about figuring out how to get educated on the ways that you can do that. Um, so I do think, like I said, neighborhood association, um, talking to your council member about what resources are available are both great ways to, to step into that. Along that line, I, I agree that other resources, call the chamber. Uh, the chamber of commerce has staff people do things like that and advise you. Don't hesitate to call a developer if you know one. But uh, we get those calls all the time and just say, well, what, this, I suggest you do this or that or whatever. But don't hesitate to ask. And uh, I used to say I've been kicked out of finer places, so I just <laughs> go ahead and call and see. But, uh, but again, don't hesitate to try because uh, right now we're looking at the, the new the grocery on Romney Road. It's one of our projects, and we've got neighborhood impact input, lots of ideas, very good ones, and something will happen there. So it just takes a little time, and 
don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, yeah. So asking the right questions, talking to the right people, figuring out what you need to learn, learning what you think you need to learn and what you're not sure you need to learn, and then cobbling it together. So I'd like to end with one final question, um, maybe in just a, a few words, because we're at 10 o'clock right now. There are just so many questions still left. I, I feel like these should be an hour and a half, really. Um, so the, I'd like to wrap up with a, a question for each of you. Um, what role can your organizations play in recovery following the pandemic? There's going to be no shortage of needs. Um, there is currently no shortage of needs, and that is not going to change, um, at least in my opinion. Um, so what can you do to, to kind of help with that? In just a few words, so we'll wrap up. From a regulatory standpoint, opportunities. Uh, we're looking at new opportunities, uh, looking at our zoning ordinance, as Brittany said, just from a, a modernization perspective. But uh, whenever we're looking at these things, I think people are looking at different opportunities uh, within the zoning ordinance and within their place and space to, uh, to grow and advance. You know, I think for us, um, it's really um, reckoning with equity and, and how we are going to grow going forward in an equitable way. You know, the, the pandemic and really two pandemics um, that, that really came to light, obviously are all of our issues that we're beginning finally to reckon with around racial justice and then the impact of COVID, I think, you know, particularly is going to make equitable, equitable excuse me, development moving forward such a key factor. It's how are we going to house our neighbors at, at all income levels? How are we gonna develop in a way that benefits everybody and isn't hurting the, the people where these developments are happening. So I think for Fade Alliance, that's something that's really top of mind for us moving forward is how are we going to be part of um, promoting equitable development policies that, you know, for us to grow in a smart and, and responsible way moving forward, it really is going to have to focus on equity. So we're looking forward to educating, um, educating, sorry, this is a lot longer than I meant it to be. <laughs> But educating people, doing research around these issues, and look forward to, to talking to a lot of our neighbors about them in the coming year. I think, you know, from our perspective at, at CORE, it sort of accelerated a, 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 something we had underway, which was, you know, called Hub Lifestyle, which was really to make the buildings uh, much more than just buildings, but, but interactive and meeting the needs of our, our residents and, and uh, incorporating, you know, all of those issues that, uh, you know, as we uh, face configuration issues and all those things, but more importantly, just, you know, the, the, uh, the, the needs of the residents and the communities and how do we incorporate them in our buildings to make them kind of a living part of what those solutions are, which we're, as I said, accelerating our efforts in. My point is, I guess, that this too shall pass and we need to be ready for that. And it's really been amazing throughout the COVID crisis that the creativity and imaginative uh, type projects that people are undertaking here going forward in spite of and, and working through it. And we all need to team together to be sure these things continue. Thank you guys. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, there are some questions we didn't get to. We hit on pretty much all of the themes though. So if you had a question we didn't answer, I hope that you found um, some answer even if indirect. Uh, feel free to reach out to people if you have anything you'd like to talk about. Um, there's no shortage of resources, but it is harder to find the resources than it maybe should be. Um, folks in the audience, now's a good time to go and click on all of those links that Sam has been dropping into the chat. We're about to close out, so click them all now. Um, we talked about a lot of things about repurposing lots and buildings on challenges and regulations and so much more. I think this is one that I'll be going back to watch myself. Um, as we wrap up, I'd like to thank everybody for helping make this possible. Um, our panelists, Studley Webb with the Webb Companies, Brittany Rossmeyer with Fayette Alliance, Hal Bailey with the City of Lexington, and Tom Harrington with Core Spaces. I'd also like to thank, thank Sam Castro and Chris Woodall for coordinating and handling the Q&A. Um, and our technical support is always appreciated. I think we have Chris Edwards on the back end today. So thank you for, for offering that support. Um, the Mornings with Planning series 
we'll continue to discuss new ways to reconnect, reimagine, and respond in a new reality. And we want to hear from you. Um, what topics should we discuss as we move Lexington forward together? You can email us at imagine at lexingtonky.gov to let us know. Uh, we will be back on the first Wednesday of next month on February 3rd, where we'll be discussing planning for basic human needs during a pandemic. And hopefully we can talk about after the pandemic too. We're getting close now, I think. Um, for more information on future sessions, to access the recordings from this webinar, and to learn more about planning in Lexington, visit imaginelexington.com or lexingtonky.gov forward slash planning and follow us on social media. Um, thank you for spending your morning with us and we hope to see you next time.